Hi everyone, today we're gonna to be reviewing for your chapter 12 test on probability. This review video is gonna go over all the information that you'll need to know for your chapter 12 test. I know you don't have a printout of the problems in this video, so I tried to keep them as short as possible. Write down the problems we go through on this review so you can use them along with your yellow booklet on the test. You can always pause the video to give yourself some extra time to write things down. Be sure you watch the whole video and take down notes because the problems in this video are very similar to the ones you'll see on your test. We're gonna review the lessons in order. The questions on the test will also be in a similar order, starting with 12.1 and ending with 12.5. The first lesson in chapter 12 was on probability events, and this is on pages eight through 13 in your booklet. Remember that the probability of an event is found by taking a ratio or a fraction where you do the number of favorable outcomes divided by the total number of possible outcomes. We abbreviate probability with a parenthesis and then we name the event in there. So it might be something like probability of green. If that was the case, we would take the number of green and divide it by the total number of options. When we do probability, we're also going to sometimes do probabilities that involve the word or or the word and. When we see the word or, I want you to remember that or means you're going to add the probabilities together. So the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. A and B means both are occurring at the same time. Now, some events are mutually exclusive where the probability of A and B is equal to zero. So you don't always have something to subtract. You only have to subtract something if there's an overlap. If it's mutually exclusive, like rolling a one or a two on a dice, I would just add together the probability of rolling a one plus the probability of rolling a two, since I can't roll a one and a two at the same time. The other formula that we're going to use is probability of A and B. When you see the word and, remember that and means multiply. So the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. Now that we've reviewed our formulas from 12.1, let's go ahead and look at an example. Suppose you have three orange, five grape, and seven strawberry candies. Go ahead and write that down in your notes. Three orange, five grape, and seven strawberry candies. Now, anytime we're doing a probability question, you need the total. So if we go ahead and we add three plus five plus seven, that's 15 total candies. So the first part here asks us, what's the probability that we pick a grape candy? Well, the probability that we pick a grape is just the number of grape candies, so five, divided by the total number of candies. So five over 15. And then with fractions, all of your answers should be in simplest form. So simplify that. If you divide by five, you get one over three. I know I also showed you how to simplify fractions on Desmos or the graphing calculator. So you could always do that too. Probability of not getting an orange. There's a couple different ways that you could do this. Now, not getting orange, if I have 15 total candies and three of them are orange, 15 minus three means 12 candies are not orange. Or we could just look at them and say, well, if it's not orange, it must be grape or strawberry. Well, five plus seven is also 12. So the probability we don't get an orange would be 12 out of 15. And again, we're gonna simplify that down. So if I divide by three, that ends up being four fifths. Now let's look at the probability that we do grape or orange. Remember that or means we're gonna add the probabilities together. So I'm gonna do the probability of grape plus the probability of orange, and then I'm gonna subtract the probability that it's both, probability that it's grape and orange. Now here, none of our candies are grape and orange. There's zero candies that are grape or orange. This is mutually exclusive. So we can ignore that subtraction and just add together the probability of getting a grape plus the probability of getting an orange. Well, grape is five and orange is three. Now they're both out of 15, but sometimes I just like to put it over 15 at the end. 
So I do 5 plus 3, which is 8, and that's out of 15. Remember, too, these are also both out of 15, so 8 out of 15, we get that either way. Now let's say we pick an orange, then without replacing it, pick strawberry. So, and then without replacing it, this is an and. Remember, and means we're going to multiply. So picking an orange, we have a 3 out of 15 probability. And then without replacing it, now on my next draw for strawberry, if I don't replace the orange, now I only have 14 candies left because I took out one. And of those 14 candies, seven are strawberries. Now we can just go ahead and multiply those fractions together. Three times seven is 21. 15 times 14 is 210. And then we would simplify that fraction down and it ends up simplifying to one over 10. Here's one more example. We're again gonna draw two candies, but now this time, what's the probability that you pick a strawberry, replace it, and then pick an orange? Well, on my first draw, I have all 15 candies, and I wanna know the probability we pick a strawberry, which is seven out of 15. Next though, we wanna get an orange, but we replaced it, so we still have all 15 candies. So now it's seven over 15 times three over 15, and that ends up simplifying or multiplying to 21 over 225. And then we can go ahead and reduce the fraction. Those both divide by three. And when we do that, we end up with seven over 75. Now let's look at an example where we have some overlap. We have a bowl of fruit that has one yellow apple, four green apples, four yellow bananas, and two green bananas you select one fruit at random. This problem's different now because there are multiple different types of fruits that are yellow, there's multiple different fruits that are green, and there's multiple different fruits that are apples and bananas. So we have some overlap. The first thing we'd wanna do is just calculate how many total fruit that is in our bowl. So add one plus four plus four plus two, and that ends up being 11 total fruits. So for what's the probability that we get an apple, we have to recognize that there are a couple different types of apples. We can have a yellow apple or a green apple. So that's going to be 1 plus 4 out of my total of 11. So that is 5 out of 11 for the probability we get an apple. For the probability that we get a yellow, well, there's two different fruits that are yellow. We have a yellow apple or we have a yellow apple banana. So if I go ahead and add those together, one yellow apple plus four yellow bananas, again, it's out of 11 total fruits. That's also five out of 11. Now let's look at the probability that we get a yellow or a banana. Remember that or means it can be either. So since this is such a small set, I would recommend that you just look at the numbers there and you see which of the fruits fit being either yellow or a banana. This first set, one yellow apple works because that's yellow. Four green apples doesn't work because green apples are not yellow and they're not bananas. For four yellow bananas, that works because that is both. And two green bananas works because that's a banana. So if you add those together, we have four plus one plus two, that's seven. So seven out of 11 is the probability that we pick a yellow fruit or a banana. Now you could also do this with the formula for or. Remember or means add. So if we do the probability that it's yellow plus the probability that it's a banana and we subtract the probability that it's both yellow and a banana, we should also get that same answer. Yellow, we already calculated to be five. There's five yellows. For banana, if we go ahead and add the bananas, four yellow plus two green is six bananas. And then I need to subtract the ones that are both yellow and banana. Well, five plus six minus four is also seven. So seven out of 11. So you get the answer either way. I think the first way was probably a little bit easier. Next, let's review lesson 12.2 on conditional probability. 
Remember that conditional probability is when you have the probability of one event happening given that another event has already happened. This formula is right in your notes already on page 14. The probability of B given A is found by taking the total number in B and A, so in both of them, divided by the total number in A. You always divide by the one that's given. So with this type of question, you'll see a table similar to this on your test. Again, I recommend that you just take a minute, pause the video, copy down that table, and then we're gonna use that table to answer a few questions. So what is the probability that a randomly selected person is an adult? It doesn't say anything here about given they liked the ride or given they disliked the ride. It's just what's the probability that the randomly selected person is an adult? So for that, we just need the number of adults divided by the total number of people. Well, for number of adults, since adults is a column, the total adults is right here, 58. Then out of the total people, that's the total of our totals, we have 130 people. So you'd have 58 out of 130. On the test, you're gonna be asked to write your probability as a percent and to round it to the nearest percent. So to get a percent, all you have to do is take 58 divided by 130. And when you put that into a calculator, it ends up being 0.44615, and it kind of just keeps going. To switch that to a percent, remember, we either move it over two to the right or multiply by 100. So that's 44.6, but if I round that to the nearest percent, 44.6 rounds up, so it'd be about 45%. Next, what is the probability that a randomly selected person is a child given they liked the ride? This is now conditional probability. We have the word given. So probability that it's a child given that they liked the ride. Well, using our formula above, we need to take the number that our child and liked the ride divided by the total number that liked the ride. We always divide by the given. We're given they liked the ride. So for liking the ride, that's a row here. There's a total of 83 people that liked the ride. Well, the number that our children that liked the ride is 55. So 55 out of 83 is our conditional probability. Then we just go ahead and divide that on our calculator and it ends up being 0.6626 keeps going there. Again, switch it to a percent by multiplying by 100 or moving it two to the right, and it ends up being 66% if we round to the nearest percent. Finally, what's the probability that a randomly selected person disliked the ride given they are an adult? So now we have probability that they disliked the ride, and the given is that it's an adult. Well, for that, remember, our numerator is both, so the number that disliked and were adults, and then we're going to divide that by the total number of adults, because we know it's an adult. Now, for the adults, there are 58 total adults, and of those adults, 30 adults disliked the ride. So we take 30 out of 58, we put that into our calculator, it ends up being... 0.5172, and it keeps going after that. If we switch that to a percent, it ends up being 51.7, which rounds to 52%. You'll see a conditional probability question on your test later. So make sure that you've reviewed this and written down this example in your notes to use later. The next lesson that we looked at was 12.3 on permutations and combinations, and this starts with the fundamental counting principle. You already have this exact definition for the fundamental counting principle on page 17 in your notebooklet, so you probably don't need to write it down again unless you want to. The fundamental counting principle tells us that if there are m ways to do one thing and n ways to do another, then there's m times n ways to do both. If a third selection, p, is added, then there's m times n times p ways to make all three selections and so on. Let's look at a couple examples. Jenny has five flannel shirts, four pairs of jeans, and three pairs of boots. How many different outfits can she make? This is the fundamental counting principle because each of these events 
have a certain number of ways to do them. I like to draw blanks when I do the fundamental counting principle. Jenny first gets to pick a flannel shirt. Then she gets to pick jeans. And then she gets to pick boots. There's five choices for the flannel shirt, four choices for the jeans, and three choices for the boots. Go ahead and just multiply those three numbers together, five times four times three, and that's 60. That means Jenny can make 60 different outfits. We can also use the fundamental counting principle for things that repeat or don't repeat. Like how many different three digit passcodes can be made if the digits can be repeated? Now remember, when we talk about digits, there's 10 different digits. We're including the numbers zero to nine. So if I'm making a three digit passcode, I'm gonna write out my three blanks and the numbers can be repeated. That means there's 10 choices for the first number and then I still have 10 choices for the next number because I'm allowed to repeat it, and 10 for the third. If we go ahead and multiply that all together, that ends up being 1,000 different passcodes. Now, if we're not allowed to repeat them, that's a little bit different. Now I have 10 choices for the first digit of my passcode, but then once I've chosen one, now there's only nine left, and then eight for the third. If we multiply that all together, 10 times nine times eight is 720 different passcodes. We also talked about permutations and combinations. Remember that a permutation is your, when you're arranging items where order matters. So if the order is important, we have to use a permutation. Permutations also are gonna be used if you're assigning people to unique positions, like president, vice president, and secretary. Since those are all different, the order that we pick, who's the president, who's the vice president, and who's the secretary would matter. To calculate the permutation, you can use the NPR button on either a graphing calculator or Desmos, or you can also use the fundamental counting principle. The fundamental counting principle works for permutations. Combinations are groupings of objects where the order does not matter. You just need a group. So with that, all positions would be equal. An example might be if I need three people to help me carry textbooks across the hall, since everybody's gonna do the same thing, carry textbooks, that would be a combination because everybody's doing the same thing. To calculate a combination, you use the NCR button on either a graphing calculator or Desmos. Let's look at an example. Suppose there are 10 people working at McDonald's. Remember that in both the formulas for permutation and combination, n is always the total. So here, our total is 10. 10 people are working at McDonald's. And for the first part, we want to know in how many ways can the manager choose who will make the fries. So one person gets to make the fries, one makes the burgers, one makes the chicken nuggets, and one makes the beverages. Those are all unique positions. Everybody's doing something different. So that would be a permutation. N is the total, so my N would be 10, and R is the number of positions that we're filling. So fries, burgers, chicken nuggets, and beverages, that's four different jobs. As a permutation, that would be 10 P four. And you can go ahead and put that into the calculator or Desmos, and it ends up being 5,040. Now, with permutations, you could also just use the fundamental counting principle. That's the same thing as a permutation. So if I think about it, if the manager has to pick somebody to do fries, that would be 10 choices for who gets to make fries. But now once somebody's making fries, they can't also make the burgers. So now there'd only be nine choices left. And then for chicken nuggets, there'd be eight. And for beverages, there'd be seven. Well, 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 is also 5,040. For how many ways can the manager pick three people to be cashiers? Notice now that all three people are going to be cashiers. They're all doing the same thing. So that's going to be a combination. And for a combination, we use um, NCR on our calculator. The N is still 10 and I'm picking three people to be cashiers, so that would be 10C3. 
So go ahead and put that in your calculator or Desmos. And when we do that, we end up with 120. Here's a quick review on how to put those in your calculator. On a graphing calculator, you hit the math button, then arrow over to probability, so PROB, and then you can pick either NPR or NCR. For our first example, we had a permutation, so I'm going to pick that NPR, and then I just type my numbers in. So it was 10P4, type 10, you arrow over, you type 4, you hit enter, and there's the answer of 5040. For the combination, you do the same thing, math, probability, combinations right there, and then you type the numbers in. That was 10C3, so I type them in, and 120. We can also do this on Desmos.com. Just go to www.desmos.com, click the graphing calculator button, open up the calculator, and then you're going to click on functions. From there, click Stats, and you'll find the NCR and NPR buttons right there. For our first one, we had a permutation. So I'm going to click NPR. And then with Desmos, you just type the numbers in. N goes first in the parentheses, so 10. Then you need a comma, and then the R comes second, so it was 10 P4. You type it like that, close your parentheses, hit Enter, and there's our answer. For the combination, do the same thing. Click Functions stats, and then click the combination button with the C. You type your N first, so 10, then your R second, 3, put a comma in between them, hit enter, and we also get 120. Let's look at a quick probability example using permutations and combinations. Suppose we have five cards with the letters A, B, C, D, and E, and they're placed in a box. You draw two cards. What's the probability that you pick B and E in any order? Well, here it says in any order. So the order doesn't matter, which means it's a combination. Now our total number of letters is five. So my N is five, and I wanna pick two letters because B and E is two letters, so R is two. So you're just gonna go ahead and calculate five C2, and that ends up being 10. So there's 10 different groups of two possible. We want to pick the B and the E, which is just one of the possible groups. So the probability of us picking the B and the E would be one out of 10. Let's say we draw three cards. What's the probability that you draw A, B, and C in that order? Now we're saying the order matters. So for this, we need to use a permutation or Fundamental counting principle is probably a little bit easier here. So if I think about how many total ways there are to draw three cards, one, two, three, well, I have five choices for my first letter, then four choices for the next letter, and then three. Well, when we multiply that all together, that's 60 different ways. Only one of those ways involves getting A, B, and C in that order. So that would be a one out of 60 for the probability. Lastly, you draw five cards. So all five of the cards, what's the probability that you draw them in alphabetical order? Alphabetical order means we want the A first, then the B, then the C, then the D, then the E, in that particular order. So again, it's a permutation or just use the fundamental counting principle quick. Got my five letters, five choices for the first, then four, three, to one, and when we go ahead and multiply that all together, it ends up being 120. So there would be a one out of 120 chance that we draw the letters in that order. The last thing we learned in this chapter was expected value. You'll see one question involving expected value on your test. Remember that expected value is the sum of the value of each outcome multiplied by the probability of the outcome. In our tables, in our notes, we abbreviated the value with an X and the probability with a P of X. So here we have a table that shows the number of children a household has in a city. What is the expected value for the number of children per household in this city? Well, before I can put this into my calculator, remember that the probability needs to be written as either a fraction or a decimal. Since these are percents, we need to switch them to decimals. To do that, just divide by 100 or move it two places to the left. 
So 36%, I'm going to use 0.36. 24% is 0 0.24. 30% is 0.30. 7%, when we move that to the left two places, we get 0 0.07. And 3% is 0 0.03. So those are the numbers that we need to use in our calculation. Then for the expected value of x, you're just multiplying the value x times the p of x. So 0 times 0.36. And then plus, I'm doing sums, 1 times 0.24. And we keep doing that until we've done every value. So 2 would go with 0.3. 3 goes with 0.07. And 4 goes with 0.03. Then you can go ahead and type that whole thing in your calculator. Use the parentheses buttons. And your calculator will give you an answer of 1.17. So that is, on average, how many children each household has in the city. It's a long-term average. Now I know it's impossible for one household to have 1.17 children, but the long-term average of that city would be 1.17. Expected value is usually going to be a decimal like that. This concludes our review of everything you'll need to know for the test. Make sure that you've written down the examples in here and that you've watched the whole video. If you need to go back and rewatch some parts and rewrite things down, it's a video so you know how to move, move around in the video and watch parts over again and pause it, do whatever you need. Good luck as you take your test. Bye.